All right, so this is the Know Your Aquifer breakout session, and um, we're just gonna go ahead and jump right in. First up, we've got Wade Oliver, the senior hydrogeologist at Enterra, talking about groundwater modeling and what you need to know. So let's give it up for um, Wade. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Is this too loud or is this good? We're all good? All right. So appreciate the introduction. Um, again, I'm, I'm Wade Oliver. I'm with Enterra. And uh, today, the, the, the talk is Groundwater Modeling, What You Need to Know. Uh, the original title for this was, was Aquifer Modeling 101. So what, what we're really talking today is, is nothing that's, that's earth shattering, and that's not a geology pun, I'm a geologist, so I'm just gonna keep running with these things. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing earth shattering, but what it is, is if I were sitting in your seat as a, as a GCD general manager, as a staff member, as someone that works with, with GCDs, what would I want to know about groundwater modeling if I'm not living and breathing it every day? So, from a takeaway standpoint, here's what I hope you get. I hope that you, you understand better what models are, what they do, uh, why we use them and how they're used, uh, and then hopefully some steps that, that you can take to get more out of them and make them um, and improve them as you move forward. Uh, in a 20 minute talk, what I hope is not your expectation is to be a groundwater modeler when you leave here. Um, if anyone's expectation is that, I, you're gonna be sorely disappointed here. So, uh, so, so take that. Um, we're gonna start first with what, what is a model. Real simply, simplified representation of a system, of a phenomenon, uh, simplified rep representation of something, okay? So that can be groundwater models, which is what we're talking about today. It can be uh, a physical model of some kind, um, like, the, like what we have on the top right. Uh, there is a beer on me to anyone after, after this who can, he can name what that model is. Um, and then a, a relevant quote here, uh, all models are wrong, and I'm sure you've seen this, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, and so that's really the, the theme of what we're going with today. And that's that um, these are simplified. These are tools, they're designed for a purpose. They are not perfect, and they don't take into account everything. So types of groundwater models, because uh, you'll, you'll in the groundwater world, you run across all of these. A, a conceptual model, and, and the Water Development Board groundwater availability models always start with a conceptual model, which is a, an understanding uh, as best as we can about uh, how this aquifer works. What are the hydraulic properties? What are the water levels? How, how is it being pumped? What's the recharge? That, that's the conceptual model. The numerical model is the the representation of it in computer code. So let's see if I can figure this out here. Down on the bottom left, we have an analytic element model. This is using the code TTIM, but that's, that's focused on, on real local scale impacts. You might have run across it in analyses of, of well spacing or if uh, a new well or series of wells is going in and you're interested in the, the impacts on a, on a scale of you know, several miles around that, that pumping center. That's the type of tool that you would use. Um, if most of your work in the GCD space relates to desired future conditions or modeled available groundwater, then you're most likely gonna be working with groundwater availability models, which is over here on the right as an example. This is the, uh, the GAM for the, the High Plains Aquifer System. And this is using ModFlow. That's the, that's the modeling code. And, and that's for regional scale assessments. Each of, the, each of the grid cells in this are, I believe in that model, are a half mile by a half mile. So you wouldn't use that for real, uh, real local scale assessments like this, but for regional scale, where you need a lot of the, the uh, high level, um, you know, what's happening in the aquifer as a whole, that's what you would use. So the, the modeling process, and I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but you have to identify the problem. What, what is this gonna be used for? Then you develop the conceptual model. How, you know, let's understand this as, as well as we can. 
then we develop and calibrate the numerical model, a sensitivity analysis, which is what are those components of the system that, that most influence the results. And then you apply it, and then, then you monitor, and, and then there's a feedback loop here, okay? So the, the, to me, the interesting th part about this is that often the problem that you identify in the beginning is not how it ends up being used in the end. And that's where, uh, I, I don't want to use too strong a weird word here, but that's how uh, some dangerous things could happen. If, uh, for example, the first groundwater availability models predate the existence of the desired future condition process. So uh, there, there was not, it wasn't contemplated when they were being developed that it was going to be used in the way that it was, that it was used there. Just as an example. So moving into um, really focusing just on, on groundwater availability models, uh, I assume that all of you, when you go home at night, you're thinking about things like, I wonder what a groundwater availability model actually looks like, right? <laughs> CE C, C, said yes. My, my, my sarcasm detector's working all the way up here. Um, so you may, you may have think about it, you may think about it like this, where it's this 3D representation of an aquifer. This is the, the northern portion of the Carrizo Wilcox. What it actually looks like to a groundwater modeler, though, is this. This is a series of uh, a dozen, 15 or so files, text files. This is the actual model, okay? These text files, when you open them up, you may see they're 20 or 30 megs. Some of them are much larger. Hundreds of thousands to millions of lines of human readable text, okay? It sounds super boring. For most people, it is. But what these models are made of are just enormous amounts of data. So each, each one of those cells, has to, you have to specify the properties, the recharge, how it's being pumped, any boundary conditions, if it's a spring. You have to specify all of those things. So that's what these models are actually made of, for those of you that were curious, like CE. Getting into how these are used, um, all, all of, the GCDs, all the, the GCDs here have to develop groundwater management plans. When you do that, you get a, a, a GAM run from the Water Development Board, and you'll get a table that looks like this. How many of you have seen a table that looks like this from the Water Development Board? Good deal. So this comes out of the model, uh, and, and it shows you things like recharge, outflow to surface water, lateral flows, flows to and from overlying and underlying aquifers. The thing that you need to make sure you're aware of when you're looking at this table is that it is not the full water budget, okay? Um, the full water budget would look something like this. And I'm gonna orient you to this. Um, each column is, is a single point in time, year one, year two. Up here, inflows, these are outflows, and this is, this is kind of a net area. So all of the inflows to the groundwater system are up here, and just to, to dig into it a little bit, because kind of like le reading a financial statement, um, a water budget can tell us a lot about the aquifer. So on the inflows, you've got recharge of 37,000 acre feet. You've got lateral flow of 13,000 acre feet, but that's inflow, but that's balanced with a lateral outflow of 9,000, so net of 4,000 out or in. Um, river leakage, 3,800 in, but 17,000 out. So on the whole, for this aquifer, uh, the streams are losing, you're, you're losing groundwater to surface water. That's an important thing to know about the aquifer. Uh, pumping here is relatively small, only 5,000 acre feet. And if you look at the totals, 86,000 acre feet inflow, 126,000 outflow for this year. So the change in storage that you see for this aquifer, the, the volume of water after year one is 40,000 acre feet less than at the beginning of year one, okay? So that's how, that's how you read one of these things. 
And then if you start tracking these budgets year to year, you'll see how changes in the water budget and changes in pumping, changes in, in this case, recharge, affect, uh, affect the overall groundwater system and how much flows out of surface water. The other way, or one of the other ways that these GAMs are used in the joint planning process, and I, I know that a, a lot of you guys are really intimately familiar with this, I'm going to keep this brief to say that um, they're used very much to, to define aquifer uses and conditions, to define environmental impacts, and, and more generally to balance conservation and preservation on one side with the highest practic practicable level of groundwater production on the other. So, from a policy standpoint, what is that balance, the, the, the sweet spot between those two that you as districts, you as GMAs want to, want to hit? And most, most DFCs, most desired future conditions are expressed as drawdown. And uh, I, I have run across this many times, so I feel the need to explain it, but maybe you all understand it real well. In the model, you have lots of different values at all individual grid cells. And then the results that you get, whether from a consultant or from the Water Development Board, are an average for an area. So if you see this, we basically have, let's say these are drawdowns, going from 10 feet down to zero feet, okay? If you're looking at a, if you uh, group these together, average this top, uh, this northwest quadrant here, the average there is eight feet. That doesn't mean that it's a DFC of eight feet everywhere. That means on average in this area, it's eight feet, okay? That's a key thing that keeps coming up in the DFC process that folks need to understand. Five feet, five feet, two. For the GMA as a whole, in this example, it's an average of five feet. Again, it doesn't mean five feet everywhere, just that the average over that area is five feet. Getting towards the end, um, this is something that I don't think is taken advantage of uh, very much in the GCD space, or maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think that it's something really valuable to you guys. The, the GAMs serve as a repository for a ton of aquifer information, okay? Each, as, and you know this because you've looked at the voluminous reports that come here that are developed as part of this process, but for nearly every GAM, there is a geodatabase, so uh, something that you can pull up in ArcGIS that has all of the data that went into that GAM. You can request it from the Water Development Board. It's right on their website. And it has tons of information. Each of these are folders, and there's, there's one or two dozen files underneath each of these that is useful hydrologic information for GCDs. So I encourage you to go get that if you haven't already. There are limitations of models. You know this takeaway here is that they aren't perfect, but uh, make sure to use them for uh, what they're designed to be used for. And then uh, just from an action items standpoint, what you can do, help collect data, keep it organized, and we're talking water levels, water quality, aquifer tests, something really key here, pumping. I, sometimes your districts, it, it's politically a problem to, to get really good pumping data. Having developed many models, uh, pumping is one of the hardest things to get right. So the better information you can have and organize on that, the, the better your model is going to be there. Share that information with the Water Development Board and, and participate in the process when it comes up that uh, your models are being updated. So with that, happy to answer any questions. I appreciate it. Any questions? All right, thank you.